Ah, the PlayStation 2. A console with so much love poured into its hardware design that Sony seemed to consider all sorts of elements that were missed by many who bought it. A DVD player capable of running some of the best games of its generation wasn't just about what it could do, but what you could do with it. You could even spin the little PlayStation logo on the DVD tray just so the emblem was aligned with however the player oriented their console, if they wanted it laid flat or standing upright. The console held host to a wide array of games for a huge variety of audiences. There was at least one strong contender for any genre on the system that would make gamers weep with joy. Final Fantasy X, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the Tony Hawk's games, or Ratchet & Clank. This console had it all, and everybody wanted it all. These are just a few games we're covering in this video, but we'll start with a franchise that many desperately want a sequel to in our modern age, Time Splitters. Created by Free Radical Design, Time Splitters is considered the spiritual successor to the massively popular rare developed FPS titles GoldenEye 007 and Perfect Dark. The first entry in the series was exclusive to the PlayStation 2, which led to many playing the sequel on Sony's console as well. The series had a great crossover of gameplay elements, design concepts, and a fair chunk of the same developers as GoldenEye. Each entry into the Time Splitters series was absolutely littered with references and Easter eggs, like with the character of Harry oh, Tipper, yeah. who was introduced in the first game. That's right. Harry wasn't just an original character, but was named after the former facilities manager at Rare, Alan Tipper, as a sign of respect for their former Rare co-worker, and perhaps as a sign of respect for his rather smashing mustache. In the second Time Splitters, the game's first level is set in Siberia, which in itself seems to be a reference to Goldeneye. Both games have their first level set in Russian locations with a focus on a dam. Even the alarms for both locations are rather similar. For the third entry, Future Perfect, the arcade mode map Disco contains a record that can be seen on the mixing desk featuring the artist Norgacious G. This is a double reference, first to the popular rock duo Tenacious D, but also to the Time Splitters series composer Graham Norgate. Mr. Underwood, featured in the second and third entries, is also the result of a reference, this time to a totally different type of media to a character of the same name from the popular novel To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Harper Lee's character is described as using a double-barreled shotgun, as well as a description for his appearance that matches closely to that of Mr. Underwood from Time Splitters. Another memorable series on PlayStation is Ratchet & Clank. One design from Ratchet & Clank Going Commando had to be altered after the team at Insomniac Games found that they'd broken Sony's guidelines. While taking a look around Clank's room, the player may find a gaming console called the Game Pyramid, but at one stage in development, this system was actually just a PlayStation 2 console. However, PlayStation's TRC states that a game is not able to depict a PlayStation 2 system if it's possible to destroy it, and so the team thought about replacing it. At first, they thought about swapping it out for an Xbox, but this also had to be removed, as another guideline stated that devs can't depict a competitive system in the game either. While some titles had small changes during development, other games were unrecognizable when compared to their early builds. Capcom's Onimusha Warlords was the first entry in this new franchise on the PlayStation 2, but it was originally conceived by Yoshiki Okamoto in 1997, when he considered the idea of creating Sengoku Biohazard, a spin-off of Capcom's popular 1996 Resident Evil, but with the twist of introducing ninjas. The game would have been set in the Sengoku period, and events would have taken place in a ninja house littered with booby traps, in a similar vein to that of Resident Evil and the Spencer Mansion. The game's action would have involved close-range combat with swords, and shurikens being used for long-range attacks. The idea would have included a number of fantasy elements as well, including scrolls, ninja magic, and other ninja techniques, while the mansion would have had hidden doors behind walls and ceilings that could fall on the player. This concept actually began life on an entirely different console, originally intended for release on the ill-fated Nintendo 64 add-on attachment, the 64DD. Development was shifted, however, to the original PlayStation before it was eventually moved to the PlayStation 2. This PS1 version was completely dropped halfway through development, as a result of the Onimusha team's excitement for the capabilities of the PS2. 
Now, we all enjoy early assets from video games, right? Debug menus are great. They give us a look at the tools the developers used when they were creating the very game you're playing. Leaving in debug modes can reveal some fun references that would otherwise have been dropped entirely on release. With Tony Hawk's Underground 2, banging game, an option in the game's debug menu grants the player an instant reward of 5 million points being added to their current combo score. Selecting the menu option essentially performs a trick, with the name You Cheat Like Kurt. Easter eggs involving Kurt are a running joke at Neversoft, with the name being referenced in both Underground 1 and 2, likely in reference to Kurt Gutierrez, who worked on the game's development team. Another bizarre secret developer mode, though unlikely made for debugging, can be found in the third entry of the Rayman series. Hoodlum Havoc was released in 2003, and was the first release in the main series not to be released for the original PlayStation, with the console being slowly put to bed by this time. However, it seems the devs included a special easter egg in the game so that those who enjoyed the classic low resolution of the PS1 had the opportunity to continue playing the series in a grainy fashion. In 2021, nearly two decades after the game's release, video game tinkerer Drew Lee discovered that Hoodlum Havoc includes a secret display mode for the PS2 version of the game, which involved first setting the standard video output to 480p through the progressive scan mode option, and then starting a new game with the profile name PS1. Doing this will cause the game to lower the standard output from 480p to 240p and disable texture filtering, making it more closely resemble a PlayStation game. While this alone is an interesting secret that went undiscovered for several years, there is also another bizarre reference that goes along with it, found within the game's source code. For unknown reasons, this mode is referenced to as Christian Slater mode in the source code. Possibly because, uh, uh, yeah, we don't know either. Um, I'm going to go across the street and get you some orange sherbet. From one beloved franchise to another, it might not have landed with all of the fans of the series, but Final Fantasy X definitely pushed the Final Fantasy franchise further than ever before, with its new release on the PlayStation 2. Full voice acting was now a real possibility, and so legendary voice actor John DiMaggio landed his role as Waka. During a panel at the 2017 Emerald City Comic Con, DiMaggio explained that he was instructed to give Waka a voice that sounded like an islander, with an island accent. It was around this time that he had just recently broken up with his ex-girlfriend, who hailed from Hawaii so he came up with a few different Hawaiian impersonations which landed him the role of the Blitzball badass. But this isn't the only character with an interesting background. According to a 2001 V-Jump magazine interview with the game's designer, Fumi Nakashima, she stated that her inspiration for the Albed's clothing came from bondage fashion. She recalled having various bondage books and magazines on her desks at work and that her co-workers would give her weird looks in response to seeing them laid around her workspace. And now that we've pointed out, it's quite hard to unsee it. Although Final Fantasy was popular, there's an undefeated champion of sales when it comes to PS2 games, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Everybody and their cat knows about the game's removed hot coffee minigame, and the game had another optional activity removed, drug dealing. Though this feature was removed, the player is still able to speak with the various drug dealers found in gang territories, but instead of positive interactions, Carl will be fairly direct in telling them to go away. The fact that drug dealing would have been in the game is suggested from three lines of unused text in the game's files referring to a drug's budget, how many had been sold, and how many had been bought. The idea that CJ would be able to participate in the activity of selling drugs doesn't actually line up with the game's plot, however, as throughout the story is a notably strong anti-drug subtext, with CJ and Sweet wanting to make sure that drug dealers stay out of their turf. They even got to the point of murdering their former friends to make that point, and many of the game's missions have the player hinder the movement of drugs throughout San Andreas and Los Santos. This would suggest that drug dealing was dropped early on during development, but references to drugs that did wind up being present in the final release were also subdued when it came to the title's Japanese localization. This includes removing a scene in which Officer Tenpenny takes a hit of a bong, and when Rosenberg is seen doing a line of cocaine. 
At times, even the game's camera angle is altered to make it easier to hide these references. This does result in some oddities with the game's subtext, as the angle of the main protagonist holding a strong anti-drug stance is somewhat subdued through the removal of these elements. Did you also know that actress Catherine Beaumont, who voiced Alice in Alice in Wonderland at age 13, reprised her role in Kingdom Hearts over 50 years later at the age of 64? Or that there's many PlayStation 2 games that the West never got? For a whole hour of PS2 facts, check out the video on screen. And what do you guys think of a ninja-themed Resident Evil like how Onimusha was planned to be? Are you excited about a new title as a release in the future? Let us know in the comments. I really want to play a ninja-themed Resident Evil. I didn't know I wanted to until I wrote this script.